us. Welcome, Dr. Hasbrook. Thank you, Ala. Um, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you today about uh, this topic of fluency. And I'm just realizing that the uh, the screen I have up available right now is not the right one. I've been working on lots of presentations. We're going to talk about fluency today, and I'm really anxious to have that opportunity. But before we start, we have a few poll questions to ask you, just so we can get a sense of our audience and uh, tailor this to your specific needs. So we'll do that poll now, and then we'll get started. Got a nice mixture of folks on the line, teachers and administrators and some coaches and a few other categories. Common Core Foundation Skills um, sounds looks like it's about an even mix of those of you who have had some training on Common Core standards and those of you who haven't yet, we're going to be very specifically and narrowly targeting one area of that today. Yeah, just about a 50-50 split on that. And our last question is about uh, the exciting new online courses that uh, we have available and on-site trainings, if any of you have had that chance to participate in on-site trainings offered by uh, my colleague Vicki Gibson or me. Some have. Looks like the most of the bulk of you have not. So we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for taking the time to participate in that poll. And we'll go ahead and launch this conversation about foundational skills. And um, starting with this notion of what the key goals. The foundation skills are part of the Common Core State Standards of English Language Arts. And in general, there's uh, a, an overarching goal of all the Common Core English Language Arts uh, standards, and that is an, a very ambitious goal that all of our students are going to be able to read and comprehend, not just read. It's very clear. If you carefully read, study the Common Core standards, um, they are focused at every level about helping students understand what they've read. So read and understand. But where we've taken it up a notch with the Common Core standards is increasingly complex text and a balance between literary text, which we've done a pretty good job of focusing in in the last few years, but now we're being asked to move our students' skills into challenging informational text as well with almost a 50-50 split. So we're going to have all students reading, comprehending complex text, both literary and informational, and do it independently and proficiently. And I know when I think about those skills, I two questions come to mind immediately. How in the world are we going to get there? And is this even possible to think about achieving? And I start many of my workshops with this quote, because I think at this point, uh, at 2013, the start of the 21st century, we really are ready to make this statement of fact. So this is um, not an opinion statement here or a philosophy statement, I strongly believe and believe I have the evidence, credible evidence to support it, that we have enough 
uh, that we do have the skills and strategies uh, available to us to reach competency at grade level for approximately 90 to 95 percent of all students. When we talk about all students, that is a lovely goal. We should uh, try with all students. But the scientific evidence is compelling uh, enough to say that we can reach 90 to 95 percent of students reading at reaching grade level. That is well beyond where most schools have achieved. Um, but it is, as I say, a scientific fact. We have study after study. Some of the references are listed there below. We're going to be uh, uh, making available handouts of this presentation to you after the present after the webinar is finished they will be sent to you and all of those references will be there but we're going to achieve this um, and these statistics of 90 to 95 percent do include many of the students with dyslexia and other learning disabilities that I know a lot of you uh, teach or are responsible to support we are going to achieve this when our teachers are well informed and well supported. Just giving our instructors, our educators in the classroom the information is not enough. We need to be sure that they are well supported. I'm very glad to hear that we've got administrators and coaches on board because what we need from teachers is to provide intensive, comprehensive, high quality instruction and as needed, targeted intervention. So can we get there? Yes, we certainly can. Um, but we need to have that information um, at our hands. So knowing what those common core standards are um, in, is going to be one of the first steps of, of achieving these goals. So as I said before, in reading, the standards uh, are requiring that we achieve skill levels in literacy, text, literature text, informational text, and help our students achieve those foundational skills. The so that's the reading part of English language arts. It also has strands in writing, speaking and listening, and language. And there's another strand uh, for literacy specifically in the content areas, history, social studies, science, and technical subjects. That is a separate strand for grades 6 through 12. Literacy in the content area is embedded in the reading strand for uh, K through 5. So that's what the English language arts uh, basically look like. Today we are focusing in on one piece of that, those all-important foundation skills. The uh, introduction uh, materials to the Common Core Standards, when they discuss the foundational skills, make this point that these skills are not an end in and of themselves. They're not important to teach just so our students acquire these skills but instead a very important, necessary uh, component of an effective comprehensive reading program. There are too many people who look at those foundational skills and feel that they were just kind of tacked on to the Common Core standards. Um, and that may be because in some ways they were, actually. Uh, the original draft of the Common Core Standards went out for review, and one of the pieces of feedback that came back was that um, these, these are exciting, ambitious, very comprehensive standards, but you, you forgot something. You, you forgot to teach the children to read. So the group authoring these standards went back and did add the foundational skills, but they they came to understand that they are uh, a necessary component. Those Our students have to achieve these standards in order to achieve any of the other ambitious Common Core standards for reading and understanding text. So here they are. These are the foundational skills. These are geared just for K-5, and I'm going to discuss um, that a little bit later. But they are there are four, as you can see, print concepts, phonological awareness, phonics and word recognition and fluency. And this list may seem very familiar to some of you uh, listening to this webinar, those of you who were familiar with the National Reading Panel report, which had a list of five components on their list. This list uh, was created. These components were derived from a massive review of uh, research literature available to us in the year 2000 and found that these five components were the components most 
supported by research as being necessary for our students to succeed in reading. You may see some similarity. I'll go back to that slide. Print concepts, phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, phonics, fluency. Um, there's somewhat of a match. What's missing from this list is print awareness. The um, authors of the Common Core Standards added that to, to the list. What's not there, um, noticeably, is vocabulary and comprehension. Uh, and I've had people ask me, does that mean that the Common Core Standards don't find that vocabulary and comprehension are important? Um, uh, no, I think that they did uh, the appropriate thing with those two components of reading. They embedded them in the K-12 standards because vocabulary, for instance, is not a skill that you start teaching in kindergarten and then you finish teaching in grades five. It's not as much a foundational skill that way. So the vocabulary is embedded particularly in that language strand. If you carefully read the language strand in the English language arts standards, it is almost all devoted to vocabulary. And what about comprehension? Why aren't there <laughs> comprehension standards in the Common Core state standards? Well, there are. And what the way that the Common Core has handled comprehension is that really the English language arts standards, aside from the foundational skills, are all comprehension standards, how to read, how to read carefully, how to think and talk and write about what you're reading. So many people have referred to the Common Core English Language Arts Standards as comprehension standards. Vocabulary is embedded there. So with the four standards um, in the uh, Common Core for K-5, let's, we're going to focus today just on the fluency piece. This is something that uh, some of you probably know I have devoted a lot of time to. I was thrilled to see that the Common Core uh, made room for including a foundational skill standard specifically to, to fluency. We learned from the National Reading Panel how critically important it was. And uh, I've done a lot of research over the last few decades on fluency and was very pleased to have the opportunity last year to finally get around to creating a manual for teachers. I was uh, very honored that my colleague Deb Glazer agreed to co-author this with me. And um, we do have this available at our Gibson Hasbrook Associates website that you see listed there. Uh, training manual uh, specifically to help teachers understand what fluency is, how to assess it, how to plan and teach fluency, and then integrating fluency. So uh, what I've talked about for the remainder of this webinar, much of this is um, uh, drawn from this manual and the little booklets um, that are um, summaries of the entire uh, manual. So what is reading fluency? Uh, I found it very interesting when Deb and I got ready to write our book. We went looking for the definition of fluency and found that uh, these folks, Kuhn, Schwanenflugel, and Meisinger, who are uh, some of the top researchers in the world on fluency, as late as 2010 said, basically, we still don't understand exactly what fluency is. And that is because it is very complicated. Um, Steve Stahl and Melanie Kuhn uh, said this very brilliant statement, which I often quote and I think summarizes what fluency is very nicely. It's kind of that you know it when you hear it. If a student from at any grade level is reading aloud from text and it sounds as effortless and flowing um, and accurate as speech does, they are probably a fluent reader. That's what we should aspire to. But as a working definition, that's really not all that helpful. So because there wasn't a, a universally agreed upon definition of fluency, Deb and I felt that we could uh, make one up ourselves. So this is what we came up with, uh, that fluency is reasonably accurate reading at an appropriate rate with suitable prosody. And for those of you who are not reading people, or even if you are, prosody is a more technical word that generally means good expression. 
but that accuracy rate and good expression leads somewhere. We don't just say a student is fluent because they can, because it sounds like speech. They need to be using that fluency to understand what they've read. And then we added in their motivation because as educators ourselves, we know how deeply uh, fluency affects motivation. Our students who struggle with fluency are most often our least motivated uh, readers. So it's all tied together. So those are the very specific and concrete aspects of fluency. You may have noted in this definition there are some more ambiguous words. We're saying accuracy, accuracy should be reasonable and rate should be appropriate and prosody should be suitable. So um, let's talk about that. In terms of accuracy, uh, there really isn't any um, defined from research levels of accuracy that we can all agree on, in part because uh, accuracy really does vary. We, we find it reasonable at times for our accuracy to be very low. When we're perusing um, uh, a magazine for pure entertainment, when we're glancing through the Sunday paper and just uh, accuracy is not all that important. There are other times when reasonable accuracy would demand 100% um, would be the only reasonable uh, potential outcome or the only reasonable standard. So in general, Rosinski et al. in the latest handbook on reading research, when talking about grades 2 through 12 and above, came up with the figure of we should aim for at least 95% accuracy. So uh, what about our younger students in K-1? What would you think? Is that going to be higher? Is that going to be lower for our very beginning readers? Well, many people are surprised that the generally agreed upon accuracy level for those students is actually higher, significantly higher. Um, and that is what that basically means, and you see this reflected in the Common Core Standards, that it's extremely important that the text we use for our beginning readers be on the easy side. We need to be sure that we give them text and support them with text that they can feel confident about. We've learned the, uh, our lesson the wrong way by having uh, expecting our students too early to read too difficult text. It is certainly the goal of Common Core Standards that they will get there, but in the early grades, um, let's make sure that the, that the text is well known to them. They can read it with high levels of accuracy to build that confidence in uh, themselves and in the act of reading. So how about rate? What would be an appropriate rate? Um, we do have, and I'm going to share with you, some oral reading fluency norms that are geared to words correct per minute, or a, basically a rate measure. Um, that's actually some research that I have done. And again, many people are surprised when we say the appropriate rate that we should be aiming for is the 50th percentile. I get this reaction a lot from people. Uh, really? Average, the 50th percentile is adequate. I mean, that doesn't make sense to us, many of us as professional educators, because there are very few things where the 50th percentile um, is, is appropriate. Uh, the reason uh, that I have thought a lot about this is because the research that I've done, a couple of major studies, uh, both with my colleague Jerry Tyndall, where we studied, we uh, sampled the oral reading fluency of students from grades 1 up through 8, um, hundreds of thousands of students reading all different kinds of texts, and created um, a chart, a couple of charts. The two charts I'm going to share with you now will be sent to you along with the handouts for this after the webinar. Some of you may be familiar with this chart. It's published a few years ago in The Reading Teacher. It's widely used as a um, a way for us to get a sense of how students read when presented with unpracticed grade level text and the opportunity to read it aloud for one minute. We did that kind of sampling from thousands of hundreds of thousands of students, as I said, from grades one through grade eight, and then created percentiles. One of the um, 
things we tried to do when we first put out this chart was draw people's attention to the 50th percentile with those little dotted lines because that was one way we wanted to emphasize that although clearly there are students who do read at the 90th percentile um, and the 75th percentile, it's the 50th percentile that's the most important. So I've actually uh, modified the chart to be the one you're seeing now, which is just the 50th percentile. The other chart is inform informative. It's interesting to know. Um, those of us who work with struggling students, we can check to see if they're closer to the 25th percentile or 10th percentile. But where should we should be aiming is the 50th percentile um, on unpracticed grade level text. And the reason that we conclude this is because we really have quite limited evidence from research that suggests there's any benefit to students reading significantly above the 50th percentile. Those students who do read at the 90th and 75th, they tend to be very good readers in general, but there's no evidence that the reading at a faster rate of words correct per minute leads them to be better comprehenders or have higher motivation. So we don't have compelling evidence that says we should push our students above the 50th percentile. On the other hand, when we ask how fluent students should be, there's significant evidence that it is crucial, uh, imperative, you can put any synonym you want to in there, that we must help our students get at or near the 50th percentile. Why? Um, to support comprehension and motivation. It's not just to hit a number, it's because access to comprehension and motivation to read is significantly um, undermined when students are not at the 50th percentile. So that's the rate we recommend. In terms of our definition of suitable prosody, prosody being the pitch, tone, volume, emphasis, rhythm of, of uh, oral reading. It should, as uh, Stahl and Kuhn said, mirror spoken language and prosody does convey meaning as well. But um, there are times when abnormal pitch, intonation, phrasing, or pauses can be suitable. You think of dramatic readings or poetry readings or conversation or passionate arguments. Uh, prosody is going to change. So it should be suitable for the moment. There's no one size fits all for all of this. So to boil all this down, what is reading fluency? It is essentially the ability to read accurately. And please note that that's what's listed first. There are way too many people who misunderstand fluency as being about reading fast. It is not. It's about reading uh, reasonably accurately at an appropriate rate with suitable expression and phrasing. Um, and we refer to those those three things as the components of fluency, and of those components, the accuracy and the rate are the most important. But what makes fluency so complex, um, well, the reasons expression and, and phrasing are not as um, important or valued is because of their contribution to comprehension. The, there's far less research on prosody, but uh, right now it seems to be pointing in the direction that prosody is a um, outcome of comprehension. It is hard to use the appropriate expression if you have no idea what the words mean, rather than prosody contributing to comprehension. So with comprehension being the all-important goal, we want to be sure that we're emphasizing the most important components, the accuracy and the rate. But as I was saying, one of the things that makes fluency so complex is not only do we have those components, but we have all of these things going on at the same time. In order to be a fluent reader, you need word decoding skills. You need text decoding skills. You need comprehension skills, multiple comprehension skills, all working at the same time. We refer to these as the mechanics of fluency. Um, so it is a complex text. So let's take a look at what the common core foundational skills uh, specifically are um, for K through 5. They do separate them out from kindergarten as a separate skill and then uh, grades 1 through 5. And in kindergarten, I'm uh, actually a big fan of how they worded this standard. This is it. This is the fluency standard for kindergarten. The expectation that those of you are our kindergarten teachers or 
coaches who work with kindergarten teachers or administrators. Um, th this is so important, and it uh, just makes so much sense that the goal by the end of kindergarten is that our students would be able to read emergent reader text with purpose and understanding. And they defined emergent reader text um, as consisting of short sentences with previously learned sight words and short decodable CVC, consonant vowel, consonant words with rebuses. And they define rebus as a, a picture or um, uh, that, that can be used for a word or phrase. So that's what we want our kindergartners to be able to do. Please note that there's nothing there about rate. There's nothing there even about accuracy. We know from research that the text that they have, uh, that they are attempting to read, should be uh, text that they can read somewhere around 97 to 98 percent accuracy at least. So it should be uh, easy text by the time they're attempting to read it. But their job, <laughs> our goal, is to get them to read that text with purpose and understanding. We'll worry about all the other components later. By the time we get to first grade through fifth grade, the, uh, we focus more in on those component skills of reading. So the wording of the, of the Common Core Standard Foundational Skills for Fluency says this, that uh, students will read with sufficient accuracy and fluency to support comprehension. And based on what I've shared with you so far, I hope that you would feel, like I do, uncomfortable with their use of the word fluency there. They should not have used the word fluency there. They are using fluency in the mistaken way that many people do, many people do, here real experts did. They are using fluency as a synonym for rate because, and I know that, because you can't have fluency without accuracy. So to say you're going to have accuracy and also fluency um, is just con convoluted thinking. That's not what they mean. So on your copies of your Common Core Standards, get out a red pen and edit the foundational skills. We have permission to do this from the authors, the creators of the Common Core Standards. In their introduction, they said this is a living work, that the standards are intended um, to uh, be adjusted. As new and better evidence emerges, the standards will be revised. So I take that as permission to say we can revise them ourselves because we have better evidence. Uh, they don't mean fluency there. They mean rate. So once we've made that change, the rest of the standard is really nice. We are going to help our students read with sufficient accuracy first and rate to support comprehension. That's why we're fluent readers. We are not fluent just to get a number. We're fluent to support comprehension. And it's further explained this way. Students will be able to read on-level text with purpose and understanding using that accuracy and rate. So purpose and understanding right there. If they read orally, they will read with accuracy, rate, and expression. I'm so appreciative that they put those components in the right order, accuracy first, followed by rate, and then expression, and grateful, too, because my work, uh, my professional career has been working with struggling readers, that our struggling readers can achieve this after many, many practices. So read on-level text. Um, with many readings, successive readings, with accuracy, rate, and expression. And then they should be thinking about what they're reading. It's not just getting to the end of the line and saying, I'm done, but thinking about what they're reading using context uh, or self-correction self so that the text is making sense and reread as necessary. This is, with our little adjustment there, a lovely um, standard for fluency from kindergarten to grade five. However, the last concern personally that I have with the fluency standard is that they ended it at grade five. Um, when you have the Hasbro and Tyndall fluency chart in front of you, um, you will see that fluency does not finish developing at the end of grade five. We have evidence that from that research study that that it continues to grow and develop through eighth grade. There is a leveling off uh, at around the 150 words correct per minute. But 
sixth graders achieve 150 words, seventh graders, and eighth graders, according to our data, which implies that fluency is still developing because each of those grade levels is reading more difficult text. So um, uh, even for typically developing students, fluency is not done by the end of grade five. And for our struggling readers, uh, as many of you work with those students in middle school and high school and beyond, uh, we still need to be working on fluency. So let's all agree here that we're not going to stop doing that work at grade five. So. Now, uh, what do we, should we be thinking about, about how to achieve this with instruction? What does the current research say about effective fluency instruction? I love this quote from my colleagues, Melanie Kuhn and, uh, and, her, and her colleagues, that whatever instruction we do in fluency, it's critically important that that instruction assists readers in becoming truly fluent readers rather than just fast ones. I, I, I feel that this is, um, I'd like a t-shirt, actually, with this, this quote on it. It's so important. So many people uh, have mistaken fluency for reading fast, um, and it is not. We need them to become truly fluent. Being, meaning that they read with um, uh, reasonable accuracy uh, at an appropriate rate with suitable prosody that leads them to comprehension and motivation. That's what fluency is, and that's what we've got to do with our instruction. When Deb and I wrote our training manual for teachers, Deb came up with this idea. Um, based on her experience as a teacher trainer, a supervisor, someone who works all over the country with principals and, and um, other administrators, what would be a quick, easy way, and reading coaches as well, what would be an easy, quick way to help our teachers remember the key components of fluency instruction? And she came up with this triple A, which I think is very clever. This was her idea. Anytime I walk into a classroom and I see fluency instruction going on, I want to see three things. I want to see that students are reading the words uh, with reasonable accuracy. It's not just about speeding along, that accuracy is being emphasized. Reasonable accuracy doesn't have to be perfect, um, but it has to be reasonable accuracy. The second um, thing I'm looking for, uh, the second A for fluency instruction, is that they are building toward reading words and connecting with ideas automatically. Many of you, with again, with a reading background, um, may know the word automaticity. That's what we're uh, trying to achieve with our fluency instruction, is that effortless, automatic recognition and understanding of words. We build that with starting on a foundation of accuracy and then rereading and practicing and building our rate. Um, so we want to see that as well. And the third A is accessing meaning. Um, we would have put the word comprehension in there, but it doesn't start with an A. So to, to keep this triple A, we want to be sure that while students are doing their fluency practice, while they're doing fluency instruction, that, that what they're reading is still connected to meaning. That's a, a very strong message of the Common Core Standards um, and common sense, but too many teachers feel the pressure to get their kids reading fast. Instead, we want them to achieve AAA accuracy, automaticity, and accessing meaning. So how do we get there? Uh, let's start with this. The National Reading Panel and just about every other research study has concluded that for most of our students, having the opportunity to read out loud with some feedback, guided reading here really means that it's in a situation where uh, a peer tutor or a parent volunteer or a teacher is listening and providing feedback. For many, if not most of our students, that is enough. That will help them become a fluent reader. So that's why we put that first. That is very important that students have a chance to read aloud with some feedback. For many of our students, that will be enough. We do know um, from the National Reading Panel and other research that independent silent reading uh, is not sufficient to improve fluency. It doesn't mean that it has no place in instruction, um, but it's having students read silently to themselves is probably not going to have an effect on their fluency. 
the gold standard um, probably remains the repeated reading, uh, having ch uh, students given the opportunity to take a piece of text and read it multiple times. Um, there is much, if for those half of you who have uh, received some training on Common Core Standards, that is hugely emphasized um, in the Common Core Standards. They, they use a phrase of deep reading or close reading. There is a general um, movement toward students reading less text, but reading it more often, deeply, repeatedly, multiple times to learn the words, um, to get a sense of what's going on, what is the author's purpose, what is the craft, what are the embedded ideas, what is the inference. And while we're doing those repeated readings, um, at least if some of those are oral, we will definitely benefit from improved fluency by doing that. Um, some of the research on fluency is pretty obvious, like a fair amount of our educational research is. Uh, Kuhn and Stahl in a study in 2003 found that students who receive some feedback and assistance do better than students who don't receive any assistance. I, I find that rather um, uh, common sense, but it, it's important to know. I go into a lot of classrooms where I see students doing most of their reading practice completely on their own. So we want to be sure that they are getting feedback and reading with a model, hearing what fluent reading and reading along with a fluent reader um, is powerful and um, substantiated by research. And here, again, is that um, notion that while prosody is definitely a component of fluency, spending lots of instructional time on prosody um, may not be valuable because prosody develops from acquiring these other skills. So we don't ignore it. We model it. We encourage students to stop at periods, pause at commas, use their voice at the right pitch, volume, tone, those kinds of things. But uh, in terms of instruction, it should be um, a very small part, according to the research. There are There is emerging research. Um, here's Melanie Kuhn again, who's done so much of our good fluency research, saying that for at least some students, doing wide reading may improve their fluency as much as repeated reading. So instead of taking just a piece of text and reading it multiple times. For some students, reading multiple pieces of text, um, maybe one or two times, may improve their fluency just as well. However, um, subsequent research has reminded us that, again, that wide reading can't just be go off in a corner and read independently. It has to be monitored and students held accountable for what they're reading. And if we do that, uh, for some of our students, that may, uh, that may be um, a way to improve their fluency as well. Osborne and colleagues uh, reported that structured partner reading can improve fluency. So <laughs> what did they mean by structured partner reading? Um, they mean in part that we structure the process by how we set up the, those peer partners. Um, and one of the suggestions that I always make uh, because of my own experiences, both as a teacher, uh, a coach, and a parent of a struggling reader, is that we should avoid what uh, a lot of people see maybe as common sense is let's, let's put the highest readers with our lowest readers or peers. Um, and we have found that's really not uh, as beneficial. We instead would recommend this model this is a list of names from an actual classroom that I worked in where I asked the teacher who had 24 students to just make a list of her students' first names from her best reader um, to her lowest or weakest or most struggling reader. So she came up with this list. Ebony, Jasmine, Bobby are her best readers. Michael, Andrea, Ezra were her um, average readers. She identified four students, Quan, Kaisha, Francisco, and Angelica, uh, in her classroom as being very, very struggling readers. So what we, what I suggested was look at, always look at the bottom of your list and identify whether those low readers are so much lower than the others that it may be best not to ask them to do peer reading at this stage, but instead use 
the peer reading time to get some more direct, explicit instruction from the teacher. So that's what she decided to do. Those four students were going to work with her um, in some uh, more specific targeted fluency instruction. Then she took the remainder of her list from Ebony down to Ashley, divided it in half, took her top readers and matched them with um, the second half so that Ebony, the best reader, according to her judgment, this is not based on test scores or anything, it's just, it's just teacher judgment. It works out fine that way. Ebony, the best reader, was paired with Michael, who's a good, solid, average reader. What, what happens here, and then down at the bottom there, Miguel, who is a good average reader, is paired with Ashley, who's a lower reader, but not a struggling reader. So obviously, in every case here, we have a partner who is somewhat stronger than the other. So there's one, but but they're not so different from each other that, the, that there's any student who's going to be humiliated, um, embarrassed, or on the stronger side, a student who is deeply frustrated with um, a, a, a partner who is really struggling and they really don't know what to do. Uh, we certainly don't suggest in the real world that we work in um, is that uh, these partners would stay this way forever. Changing them up every once in a while is always a good thing. Um, and if, for instance, Miguel and Ashley, this happened to be a fourth grade classroom, um, if Miguel and Ashley had just broken up you know, from a two-week fourth grade love affair, we probably wouldn't pair them together. So we do use common sense with this, too. Structured partner reading. Structure also means um, giving them some guidance for what, how they should handle um, their oral reading. Uh, O'Shea and Sindlar um, said that if we, another piece of common sense research, if we cue our students to read carefully and read at an appropriate rate. It helps improve fluency versus just saying, go read and figure it out all yourself, reminding them, cueing them, um, and certainly modeling for them as well. This is a more amazing, stunning, surprising piece of research for a lot of people. Um, again, Steve Stahl and colleague found in a study in 2005 that when they used very challenging passages, 85% accuracy, well in the student's frustration level, that if they use those passages with sufficient support and monitoring, that the students improve their fluency more than if they were given easy to read passages. And I know that that's uh, counterintuitive for many of us and flies in the face of some much earlier research that certainly suggested that easy passages are what we should do. But please pay attention to the sufficient support and monitoring. There has to be a lot of instruction. This uh, result actually did not surprise me um, because of work that I had already done. Uh, Deb Glazer and I, when we were talking about text difficulty, asked our colleague uh, Tim Shanahan for his comments about that. And, this is a, a, a quote from Tim that we put into our training manual. And, and Tim so wisely said that it's um, really not how hard the text is um, or how well that text is matched to a particular student. But what's going to be beneficial is thinking about that combination of text difficulty and the amount of instructional support. Uh, if the text is easy, the students can do it with much less support. If it's tough, they're going to need um, uh, much more. So he said, what we've got to be willing to do is put in enough support and repetition for learning to take place. So when it's very hard, a lot of support, and the students may even um, may succeed even more than if given easy text. Um, as I was saying, this, this result actually wasn't surprising to me because several years earlier, I had done a study with uh, two of my colleagues where we combined three research-proven strategies of modeling, um, having students listen and read along with fluent text, then do repeated reading of short periods of uh, short pieces of text for one minute at a time, and then give them feedback about how well they did before and after progress. When we combined those three strategies on very difficult text, we found our students not only improved their fluency, but improved their comprehension. So I have some um, 
some direct uh, experience with that. In fact, I'm a really big fan of this three-step model using uh, that combines accuracy and practice for rate and graphing for feedback. Um, it's one of the most powerful models that, that I have seen. The strategy is known um, <clears throat> as the Read Naturally strategy. Read Naturally is a company that has materials available to support the strategy, but the strategy itself is free and available um, to read about and can be implemented in any classroom from about middle of first grade on up through the grades. If you'd like to know more, I would um, suggest you visit their website. Many, many wonderful resources out there on Fluency. This one's a free download, which is always nice. Um, you can go to P-R-E-L, Prel.org, and download this information. Of course, the uh, training manual that Deb and I wrote, I hope, is a great uh, resource for folks wanting to do uh, best practice in identifying fluency, assessing fluency, and teaching fluency. So what we have covered today briefly are those um, uh, what those foundation skills are with the deeper look at fluency. But there are some things not covered in the standards. I think it's important to know this, too. Apparently, it was important enough for the authors to specifically mention this. This list of what is not covered in the standards is in the introduction uh, to the English language arts standards. And they say these things. The standards are not designed to tell teachers how they should teach. They, are, they do not contain everything that can and should be taught. They're considered by the authors as a baseline, although they're very ambitious. Um, they consider them as a baseline. Many of our students will succeed even to more advanced levels. They're, they do not tell, um, uh, give guidance for how we should be providing inter intervention or supports for our English language learners. And they do not address any of the non-academic areas of vital importance to our students' well-being, the social, emotional, physical or um, subjects outside of, of literacy. So specifically, there's a lot of things left for us to do. So what is our responsibility as professional educators? Well, I think it's very clear that our responsibility is to know and effectively use what has been proven to be best practice in not only instruction, but assessment and instruction and intervention. Know what that proven practice is and then use it and support our teachers to use it in the classroom. We know that the key goal of the English Language Arts Common Core Standards is that all of our students must be able to read increasingly complex literary and informational text independently and proficiently. That, that's, a, that's a fantastic goal. But we also know that from scientific evidence that um, although we will always strive for all, what is truly proven achievable is having 90 to 95 percent of our students reach those levels of understand, reading, understanding, and we hope enjoying the process. But to achieve that, they're going to have to be taught. So that's what um, we're here to do to support you in doing that uh, through multiple resources. And I know that Ala will be sharing some of that information with you at the end, how uh, uh, my colleague Vicki there and I have partnered to expand um, the, the access to our ideas about um, RTI, differentiated instruction, and other areas through our partnership with McGraw-Hill. So I do want to thank you all so much for taking time to uh, participate in this webinar. And now I, Ala is going to um, share some of the questions that you may have uh, asked. And we'll just be able to address a few of those today. And uh, other questions uh, we can address offline later. But I'll turn this now over to Ala. And thank you again.
I'm sorry, I'm trying to open this box with questions and it's just not responding. Mm. Bear with me, please. Okay, um, one question is, will this webinar be archived? Um, so sh I can share it with my lit, uh, my lit coach. Um, the answer to that is yes. It will be archived and you will receive a follow-up email that will give you a link to the archive presentation. Um, another question asks, um, <clears throat> will the slides be available for download? Um, no, we will not make Dr. Hansberg's presentation available for download, but you are welcome to see the archived webinar at any time. Uh, Dr. Hasbrook, this one is for you. What is your opinion on structured programs such as SFA, Success for All, and their approach to fluency and comprehension? Uh, well, it would be difficult for me to talk uh, broadly about about all programs. Uh, I mean, we certainly know there's a lot of, of, of good research to support some of those structured programs. What I would be more comfortable doing uh, would be to say, uh, look at the things that I shared with you today, which are strongly supported by research, that you could take those guidelines of oral reading with feedback, um, uh, modeling to students, having lots of supported practice, if your program, whatever structured program or commercial program or teacher-made program that you're using follows those tenets, if you see triple A when you're seeing fluency instruction, when teachers know that the goal of fluency is to achieve um, reading at about the 50th percentile uh, that leads to understanding and motivation, you probably have a good fluency component in your program. Great. Um, another question asks, can you speak to choral reading, round robin reading, as it relates to strategies to develop fluency? Uh, well, yes, I would love to do that. In fact, a, a few years ago I wrote an article um, in uh, uh, the name of the article, the magazine, uh, the journal is escaping me at the moment, but an article specifically about round robin reading. Um, I find it uh, not useful. I'm not a fan of round robin reading um, uh, it, outside of small group instruction. In a small group, if I'm sitting in a small group of, of six to eight students and we are working on some oral reading practice in a very supported, guided uh, situation, having one student read and then another student read and another student take turns reading, uh, that's not a problem. In fact, it can be very advantageous. Round robin in a whole class there are many, many, many reasons that we should be dropping that from our uh, educational practice. Um, it, I, mean, I can't even go on. <laughs> there are so many reasons. <laughs> I think most of us know them because uh, in, it's just intuitive that it's not the best use of our students' time. What we can do instead um, is choral reading, and, and that's embedded in that question. I do uh, approve of choral reading where everyone's reading together. Um, I see a lot of teachers at elementary level doing that, but I've used it at middle school, high school, and in graduate school. You can overuse that where all of the students are reading aloud with the teacher's voice. You do it for short periods of time. Um, I do think that's an effective way of covering material. I don't think that it could be considered um, really anything like a fluency intervention for students. But um, I think fluency intervention needs to be done in small group instruction and with structured partner reading. OK. Another question asks, how do you help a child who is reading beyond grade level and has great comprehension but misses words while reading, having poor one-to-one -one correspondence with text? Mm. Uh, well, of course, it's always difficult for me. I feel always like, like I'm a physician here having to say I cannot diagnose uh, without actually seeing the student. And, uh, and I'm very cautious about that because people will sometimes say a student is advanced or a highly fluent reader. And um, when I get to meet them, they, they, they may have some, some things that are uh, 
maybe underdiagnosed or have been misdiagnosed, we want to be sure that students are uh, reading for meaning. If you recall, the kindergarten fluency standard basically says we should start the process of teaching our students to read so that they can read with purpose and understanding. That is the foundation. If we have students who skip that foundation, who uh, mistakenly felt that reading fast um, was the goal, we do need to do, take some corrective action, and that is moving students down to smaller and smaller and smaller pieces of text, even at the phrase level or the sentence level, and have them read it aloud, have them read it aloud a second or third time so that the rate picks up, and then talk about it. Um, I mean, as simple as for a, a first grader text like the um, the boy sat on the red rock. Okay, you read that, you read it well, you read it accurately. Now tell me who sat on the rock. What color was the rock? Why do you think he was sitting on the rock? We, do, we, do we know? What, what might you speculate? Okay, let's read the next sentence. Taking them back to where we should have started, which is always, always, always connected to purpose and understanding. So if it's an accuracy issue, we might go back and do some remediation with phonics and decoding or sight words. Um, if it's a rate issue, but strong accuracy with slow rate, we can work on that. But if it's a disconnect with purpose and understanding, um, we have some major remediation to do. All right. And one more question. Do you think it helps to tape students reading? record them, in other words? You know, I don't think it can hurt. I think most students really love hearing their own voice. And uh, I think it can be wonderful for their feedback across the year. Um, parent, don't parents love to hear their students' voices as well? So I think, um, I think it's a lovely, uh, a lovely thing to do for feedback and motivation. Um, and there could be, uh, if done well, it, it could have a remedial intervention role as well. But uh, I just think it sounds like a, a nice, fun, motivating thing to do. That is perfect. Dr. Hasbrook, thank you so much. And as we end our session, um, as Dr. Hasbrook mentioned, I would like to share with you a way that you can delve deeper into the issue of fluency with an online workshop that is written by and featured Dr. Hasbrook. This course is called Using RTI Data, and it is part of the Gibson Hasbrook family of workshops. There are four of them total, and what you're seeing right now, I think, well, maybe you're not seeing it right now. There, now you're seeing it, um, is the Gibson Hasbrook section of MHPD Online, which is the McGraw-Hill Professional Development website. And I just wanted to show you some of these workshops and, and so that you can see some of the resources available to you. As you can see, these are a great way to earn your academic credits. You can explore all the workshops right there on the site. And there's a free trial, if I can get to that. Well, maybe I can't, but I'm going to try. There we go. If you go down to the bottom of that page, you can register for a free 60-minute demo of any of the workshops. Dr. Hasbrook, again, I thank you so much for this presentation. Please bear with us. There will be a quick survey to follow up on this webinar. As we deliver these webinars, we really do appreciate your feedback. So it would be great if you could answer those questions. And we will see you again in our next presentation. Thank you so much.